Any questions for our panels? Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, the topics, just to remind you, were mental health monitoring, telemedicine for developing countries, wireless sensor networks, um, and technology uh, for zoonotic diseases and veterinary medicine. I thought this was the most fun panel. <laughs> that makes sense. One of the best. So, okay. David. Dr. Peister, um, the yes, MOAT technology, I think, is a very exciting technology. I'm wondering what sort of uh, uh, research and what developments there are in the area of uh, quality of service. I mean, it, when you start talking about patient monitoring, time-sensitive communications are very important. And in an adaptive technology like that, the old classic route loop problem, where you have jitter, latency, and uh, delineated quality of service degradation, what kind of, uh, what kind of can we anticipate there in those areas? The, an excellent question. The, the reality is that with wireless communication, you cannot guarantee with 100% certainty that you can deliver a given level of quality of service. However, given that, that limitation, I, for example, if the United States military wants to prevent you from communicating with wireless, they will. Right? We have the ability to do that. Um, the, in that context, though, or given, given that reality, you can throw an awful lot of technology at making these, uh, uh, this wireless communication extremely reliable. So the industry where there's actually some real adoption that I showed you, the oil and gas industry, this is being put in in control loops in oil refineries and uh, chemical processing facilities and things like that that have the same kinds of uh, you know, strict latency requirements. And there are serious financial uh, repercussions if you miss those latencies because they have to go into an emergency shutdown if they don't get that packet in, in time. And so the result is that there's been an awful lot of effort that's been put into doing reliable, uh, time-bound delivery of packets in these networks. So it, it costs you some power, but not so much that you can't do it on batteries for years still. Other so question. Another, another example, one of the areas, uh, GE Sensing is shipping a uh, pharma product for monitoring the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. and. They're, they're in production, it's being installed, or it is installed in a, in, uh, in a growing customer base. And there, if they lose a single packet, they have to throw out the entire lot that's being manufactured. And so you know, they, they have spent a lot of time verifying that this technology actually does give them the reliability that they need. Now that's not latency sensitive. They've just got to, by the end of the multi-day run, they've got to have all the data. But, but it is a, you know, a reliability spec. Other questions? Uh, first of all, thank you all for running uh, on time because, as you can see, when I was moderating the sessions, ran an hour late. Um, anyhow, um, uh, Christian and Carol, um, it, some of the presentations this morning were on uh, micro needle work, on uh, newer types of visualization, PET MRI. Do you, from a zoonosis and veterinary school aspect of it, do you all have need for these types of technologies? Because um, we don't see a whole Citrus as a whole hasn't any type of collaborations with veterinary school. And I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting area um, for Citrus to move into. Um, and can you just talk about what interest you all have in that field or in those fields? Um, let me, uh, maybe I can start. Um, I think the, uh, it's important to understand that we have kind of a, a split in veterinary medicine between individual animal care so the type of care that you would give to Barbaro, you know, the racehorse that broke down on the racetrack, versus the type of individual animal attention that, say, any of these chickens in the pictures got. Uh, an agricultural animal is treated as a member of a herd or a flock. And so things like, um, you know, things that would translate directly from human medicine into veterinary medicine would transfer into the individual animal care side. So we have a teaching hospital and I'm, I'm sure there's tremendous interest there. So I come from the ag animal side as a poultry veterinarian and so on a populational level, we fit more with um, some of the technologies that people have used for um, 
biodetection or um, you know the the sniffers in the um, subways in Washington DC and the bioterrorism types of technologies and a lot of those have been translated into agricultural animal species but um, I think it's important to remember that you know when we're talking about emerging diseases we're talking early you know the, the earlier you're looking at the transmission from animal to human the more rare the case is and so the more sensitive the technology has to be at detection and as you get further and further along it becomes much more difficult to stop you know an emerging outbreak but it becomes much more much easier to detect and so we play this this game at this interface of you know right now Christian and I are we've just put out a paper that you know we're suggesting to do bird monitoring as opposed to human monitoring for highly pathogenic H5N1 so avian influenza coming from Asia why because it would be much more prevalent and e easier to find in the birds as opposed to the humans so I think it, it's this it's this balancing act of you know when in the outbreak do you begin to switch and some of the technologies I think we're talking about would be looking at detecting very very rare events and you know might be hard probably they haven't been thought of yet <laughs> the only thing I have to say is on the human side you know those rare cases often take time and you know like as Javid knows when you're an ID doc you have to draw serology it sometimes can take you know, weeks to get an answer back that you feel comfortable with. Anything that can move that up a little bit quicker is is going to be like. The problem is, again, they're rare diseases. So these are not, you know, everyday things like cholesterol or, you know, blood pressure medicines. Again, it's rare stuff, but could be certainly applied pretty quickly with that. Other questions? Hi. Uh, my question is about the voice sensors. Um, if you have the sensors in a room, like in the environment and you have multiple people in the room, how good are you at distinguishing between different, the voices of different people? Um, that's, <clears throat> it, it's possible to, to do speaker identification from voice um, with the technology that's similar to speech uh, technology. So it's, it's in that layer that's above the features that we're looking at right now. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that would become important if we had that situation, if we had, say, a, a household where there are several people and we're trying to keep track of each one. So it's, uh, uh, I would say it's something we have to worry about. Uh, if I recall, the, the accuracy with off-the-shelf technologies is not too bad in a well-controlled microphone situation like this. What, what probably hasn't been explored much would be when you have microphones sort of distributed around the room and people are just talking and there's room acoustics that are all over the place. I don't know how well the speaker ID would work there. So that's, uh, that's one of those things we would definitely have to worry about. So I, I don't know what the answer is. It would, th there's certainly a technology base we could try to build on, but I think that's where we'd still be in new ground. For the hazmat suits, are people trying to put in water-cooled um, ventilators of some or water cooled fins? Uh, no, and mainly because uh, they're disposed of afterwards, so people just haven't gotten as interested in that. I mean, I think there are some smaller techniques, but not entirely. No, they've gotten obsessed with making them completely impermeable, which then becomes an issue with overheating and other things like that. And I think you're now moving towards the other side, but not, not to any great degree, no. I mean, you see, that's why I enjoy Hollywood, where you see these guys running up and down the street in those level A scuba suits, you know, which, which you need about three years of training just to put them on so you don't pass out and harm yourself and suffocate, literally. So uh, I always find entertainment as they run up and down the street. But uh, sadly, there's not any, any, you know, if you can have a mechanism where that technology is preserved but the outside of the suit is disposed of, I think you'd have pretty, pretty great use. You know, we, California, we spent, you know, I don't know, probably now close to about 10 or 12 million dollars in the last few years on those disposable suits. So you can imagine there's a pretty good market for it and it's now going to be required in all healthcare facilities. So. I just wanted to mention along those lines, there's been some uh, fairly recent DARPA uh, sponsored research on cooling soldiers uh, core body temperatures without like, you know, complex, you know, fins and cooling and motors and so on. 
Um, and uh, I think some of this work was actually done at Stanford um, and looking at sort of like a surprisingly simple system that can significantly um, pull off uh, core body temperature. So that might be something, you know, it's, and it's basically a vest you wear. So um, that might be something that uh, could be used in those cases. I hate to tell you how long DARPA initiatives make it out into the veterinary world, but, <laughs> but yes, it would be, it would be good. I, I actually have a question about the, uh, the voice recognition. And so someone mentioned that monitor, the vital sign monitoring was not of interest initially. I think your first slide, you said they thought it was the short term of that was not of yeah. direct interest. Yeah, we've got a lot of sort of lukewarm reactions from, from physicians about if we really had this, what would we do with it? Because they're, they have enough information to deal with right now, and they have to record, you know, they're, 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 they're to, 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 in a certain extent, overburdened with information right now, and they need to record information and annotate every step they do. With every new piece of information they get, there's, there's additional liability. You know, was there something in, this, in your 500 hours of monitoring traces that indicated an um, a oncoming stroke? And if they, if there was and they didn't act, then there's usually a repercussion. So they're not looking forward to dealing with this, this essentially fire, fire hose of data yeah. in the short term. In the long term, yeah, and, and uh, other, age, other actors in the space, insurance companies and especially people in the elder care space are very interested because somehow, the, you know, for elders, for instance, the level of risk is going up of something happening at random, uh, you know, uh, without warning is much higher and so it makes more sense there, but no, there's definitely an incompatibility between this new kind of monitoring, as with any prophylactic monitoring, and the, the system that we have right now. Yeah, you don't want monitors for lawyers, they're bad. Um, but the one thing I, which I defer, I actually dis disagree to an extent on that, is this idea that in emergency medical services, we do something called start triage, which if you have a, a large train derailment and you have you know, one or 200 people to go through in a minute, there's a quick triage mechanism, which actually involves vital signs and just cognition. And it's very rapid. The problem is you have to repeat it on a serial basis. So if you go through 100 people and you, know, you weed out five that are critically ill, you now have you know, 95 that have to go through it on a regular basis, I think your device would be wonderful. If you could put this on and have them you know, repeat some voice recognition or cognition, if they fail at any point, it alarms, and then you can notify that person. And that's a short term you know, in the field, because that's one of the extremely difficult things is you can maybe triage people up front, but it's that second or third or fourth layer as you're evacuating the more critically ill and you mm -hmm. ignore those people where it might have a big role um, in that. And you know, there is a lot of data now coming out. I'm sure there's a paper just published this month that either under triage or over triage in the field, medical field, both leads to mortality. So if you pick up too many people and ship them in the hospital, that's bad and increases mortality. But if you're a, bit, a little bit lax, obviously, that'll increase mortality. So getting it right, um, there's been more emphasis on this. So it's an, you know, it's a know. good area. We went. We haven't just encountered yeah. that before. Yeah. It's a good and thing to look at. Yeah, EMS. You know, and right now it's a person checking a card off and putting the tag around their ankle, and that's it. Um, I also made an oversight. Stefano, uh, I mentioned that you would be on the panel. You're still welcome to come. And we still have I, I have one right here. <laughs> All right. So any any questions before we go? To, actually, we, we have a little bit of time. Any questions? Any more? All right, so thank you all for participating, and uh, we'll close the panel. Our thanks again for our panelists uh, in the New Frontiers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.